Hello everyone and welcome back to some more magic related content. How is everyone doing today? I'm fine this lovely evening. It is evening here. And today we're having a special kind of episode. We are going to be having a look at the revealed spoiler cards for War of the Spark. Now I'm super excited for this, some new magic cards always makes me very excited. But let's just jump right into it. We start with Angrath's Rampage. One thing to note, by the way, this isn't all the spoilers. I've just picked out some of them that I kind of want to discuss some more and uh, some that I really found interesting that I had some ideas around. But yeah, Angrath's Rampage, a two mana sorcery. Choose one, target player sacrifices an artifact, target player sacrifices a creature, or target player sacrifices a planeswalker. Um, so, this is kind of an interesting card, in the sense that it's very flexible. Obviously this isn't going to be good if it is against a deck that runs, for example, many artifacts or many planeswalkers. I feel like those are the most important parts that you can use this against. And I feel like, as well, in World of Spark, there is going to be a lot of Planeswalkers. So this card might not be as good as I think it might be, but I still feel like it's going to have a place because it is very cheap and you can force him to sacrifice artifacts, Planeswalkers and creatures. This could be very good against control decks, you know those kind of things. Kind of a good counter for that. But let's see, next card. We have Bolas Citadel. I don't think that this card is going to be that good, but I kind of like the idea of it. It, it is kind of very gimmicky, but I think this could be kind of cool as well. So it is a 6 mana legendary artifact, and uh, as it says, you may look at the top card of your library anytime. You may play the top card of your library. If you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to its converted converted mana cost rather than paying its mana cost. And then it has a tap ability, which is sacrifice non-land permanence. Each opponent loses 10 health. So this is kind of a weird one. It is a... Uh, like, I'm not sure how to make this work. I'm not sure how to make this work. I'm thinking that maybe some sort of artifact deck this could be good in. You have Karn, you have Tezzeret. That's his name, right? The guy that uh, for plus one he creates thopters, one one thopters. I think that, and maybe some artifact creatures or uh, treasure creating creatures rather, or treasure creating mechanics. I think that would work with this. Because one thing to note is that you can sacrifice non-land permanent, so it doesn't have to be creatures. So something that can just pump out these tokens would be very good with this because if you get this two times against a deck that has no healing they're basically screwed or they are screwed so you could make this work but i don't think it's good i think that's the best way to put it now let's have a look at chandra fire artisan now i know some people say that the cards that have this weird art like their art is super low res some people say that oh yes these are fake I do not think they are fake, I just think that they haven't found uh, a good version with the proper uh, proper art, basically. Now, let's have a look at Chandra, Fire Artisan. Whenever one or more loyalty counters are removed from Chandra, Fire Artisan, she deals that much damage to target opponent or planeswalker. Boom. This is a burn card, kind of a good burn card as well. It is a... Uh, she has four loyalty when played. And uh, she has a plus one, which not all Planeswalkers does in this set. So her plus one, exile the top card of your library. You may play it this turn. Her minus seven is exile the top seven cards of your library. You may play them this turn. Now, the thing to remember about the minus seven is that it also deals seven damage. So uh, it is basically a seven damage nuke and you get to draw seven cards. So I think she might be good. Not a super big fan of her, but she might be kind of interesting. Now, Flux Chandler. 
three mana. I've added this just to talk a bit about pro proliferate, the new one of the new keywords added in the set. I don't, I haven't seen it before at least, so I think it's entirely new. But Flux Chandler, three mana, two two. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, proliferate, which is choose any number of permanents and or players, then give each another counter of each kind already there. So from what I understand of this is that it does... If a creature has a token, let's say a creature has a plus one plus one, that creature, uh, if you use proliferate, it gains another plus one plus one. If it has seven plus one plus ones, it still gains an, just one plus one plus one. But this is more used for those kind of tokens where they are, they are a bit more special. Or let's say you have Firemind's Research. That might be a very good target for this. So you proliferate it several times, so you get a lot of tokens on it, and you can just cast that. So I think there might be some places with, for the Flux Chandler and the Proliferate keyword, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm going to like it. I might try to do some decks around it, we'll see. Then we have Jace. I wanted to add Jace because he is one of the few cards in this set so far that changes victory conditions. And I love, I love this kind of, it's a self-mill card, and it, that is kind of hilarious. I am definitely going to make a card. I have a deck in mind already, but I am going to make a deck with him. Anyway, he is a 4 mana, 3 blue, so that is kind of expensive in the sort of sense that you need 3 blue mana. But, if you would draw a card while your library has no cards in it, you win the game instead. And it's plus one. Target player puts the top two cards of their library into the graveyard. Draw a card. And minus eight. Draw seven cards. Then, if your library has no cards in it, you win the game. Plus he has a minus four. Uh, he has four loyalty to begin with. So I feel like he is kind of okay. He is, however, not good, really. He feels quite weak when you think about it. I mean, he is, after all, like, he doesn't have any really good um, abilities. His plus one is okay. It's kind of like he could be useful as well in a mill deck. But I think a self-mill deck would be way more fun if you make with him. But he is just one part of the idea that I had. So let's have a look at Liliana, Dreadhorde General. Now, she is the one that I think will make that deck kind of work. So, Liliana for 6 mana has 6 loyalty counters, and her passive, whenever a creature you control dies, draw a card. Important. Plus 1, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Important as well. Minus 4, each player sacrifices 2 creatures. Now this kind of works well with your uh, passive, because you create a lot of tokens, and the opponent tried to match that, then you sacrifice, and you can keep creating zombies, but they start to run out of creatures. Plus, this also draws you two cards. And then you have minus nine. Each, each opponent chooses a permanent they control of each permanent type and sacrifice the rest. That is a harsh minus nine. Because that means just like, oh yes, well, you have to choose one land, one creature, one enchantment, one artifact. And it's like, oh, well, I am at one land now. I'm screwed, basically, if you don't have... Well, your board is going with it, so you're basically screwed. That is a board wipe of the most severe kind, I think. Now, let's go over to Nicole Bola's Dragon God. As I mentioned before, people were saying that the uh, cards with this sort of low-res art are not real. I'd like to think that this guy is real. I mean, there is obviously going to be a Nicole Bola's card because he is very important in the like story of this uh, deck or expansion or uh, chapter. But Nicole Bolas, five mana, one blue, one red, and three black, which is kind of weird, but it works. I mean, it's understandably weird. He is very strong for a five mana planeswalker. He has four loyalty counters. Nicole Bolas, Dragon God, has all loyalty abilities of all other planeswalkers on the battlefield. So basically, the opponent uses a lot of Planeswalkers. Nicole Bolas can use any loyalty ability of any of the Planeswalkers on the battlefield. His plus one, draw a card. Each opponent exiles a card from their hand or a permanent they control. That is insane. 
they either discard or they just like, oh well, that there goes my creature. Uh, minus three, destroy target creature or planeswalker. And his minus eight, each opponent that doesn't control a legendary creature or planeswalker loses the game. This is also one of the few cards that gives you a kind of different victory condition. I think uh, he could be good. He is obviously going to be a good card in some decks. But I don't think he will be played in that many decks. He is... Uh, after all, he is a bit special. But I think it could work. And uh, I am definitely going to try and make kind of a control deck with Nicole Bolas. Try to get him to, to minus 8 and just win that way. That is one of my goals. Now let's see. Next we have niv Misset Reborn. We have another niv Misset. This one being one mana of every color. So niv Misset. Five mana, one of every color, 6-6. Six, six, flying. When niv Misset Reborn enters the battlefield, reveal the top 10 cards of your library. For each color pair, choose a card that exactly... That exactly those colors from among them. That is worded weirdly. This might be a fake card. Choose a card that's exactly those colors from among them. Put the chosen card into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. <laughs> he is a rainbow deck and multicolored kind of creature. So from what I understand, how I kind of read this is that you can choose one card from every... Uh, from every uh, from every guild, and you get to put them in your hand. So it's kind of cool. Uh, I think this might work in a like fully, uh, you know, like guild gate deck. I think it would be kind of good. We'll see. Then we have Obnixilus the Hate Twisted for five mana. Five loyalty counters. Whenever an opponent draws a card, Omnixilis, the Hate Twisted, deals one damage to that player. And he only has a one minus ability. Now, a lot of the Planeswalkers do, the, do only have a minus ability because they aren't supposed to be like real Planeswalkers. They're supposed to be kind of weak. Omnixilis being one of them, very weak. He has minus two. Destroy target creature. Its controller draws two cards. I don't think he is good because giving the opponent an ability to draw cards is always bad. Plus, yeah, you can destroy creatures, but... And yeah, he will take 4 damage from you destroying. But I think he might not be that good. He is kind of weird. I am obviously going to make a deck around him, and that would probably be bad. But I'll, I don't think he's going to be good. Tezzereth, Master of the Bridge. 6 mana, 5 loyalty counters. He has creatures and planeswalker spells you cast have affinity for artifacts. Now for those of you who do not know what affinity for artifacts does, from what I remember, affinity for artifacts makes it so that for every artifact you have in play, that creature or card costs one less of neutral mana. I think that's affinity, don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it does. He has a plus two. Tessereth, Master of the Bridge, deals X damage to each opponent, where X is the number of artifacts you control. Gain X life. That is very good. Minus three. Return target artifact card from your graveyard to your hand. And minus eight. Exile the top ten cards of your library. Put all artifact cards from among them onto the battlefield. I think he could be very good in an artifact deck, obviously. And I think there is some very fun artifact decks that you can do with Tezzereth. And uh, combining him with um, Bolas Palace, Bolas Citadel, would be kind of a good idea, I think. Tybalt, the shittiest planeswalker there ever was. He's still very bad, not as bad, but let's see. He is three mana, five, lo five loyalty counters for three mana is kind of good. Your opponents can't gain life. He is basically for burn decks in a weird way. Minus two, create a 1-1 one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies it deals one damage to any target. So he is not that great, but he is kind of okay, I'd say. I mean, it could be worse. At least he makes stops the enemy from healing, right? That's something. Okay, Tefaris Time Twist. It is a two mana instant, and I think this might be the new dive down. Um, because it buffs the creature as well. 
So, exile target permanent you control, return that card to the battlefield under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. If it enters the battlefield as a creature, it enters with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. So it's basically, you remove it from play when it gets, uh, it, you, they play some sort of removal on one of your creatures or anything like that. It removes it from play and brings it back plus one plus one stronger. Um, and that is for two mana. I think that is kind of good. It's an instant. Dive down is still very good, but this is more of a permanent buff. Now, here we have Widespread Brutality. I really like this card. Uh, this is also to show off the Amass uh, keyword, that is also a new one. So for four mana, Amass 2, when then the armor you amassed deals damage equals to its power to each non-army creature. Now what Amass does is it gives plus one plus one counters or plus x plus x depending on what amount of Amass the card ha has, but it gives plus one plus one for that amount to your som black zombie army. If you do not control a black zombie army, this also creates a 0-0 black zombie army that it puts the plus one plus ones on. Now, uh, this card in particular, I think is kind of a cool uh, board wipe. Because this, ba this basically always deals two damage to uh, all non-army creatures. And that is if you only cast this alone. If you've already cast a lot of amassed spells and you have like a 6-6, six, six, you're going to kill everything. So I think this is kind of an interesting board clear. Um, and I think it might be very good. It is 4 mana, but it is quite reliable as well. Then we have Ruska, Swarm's Eminence. I think this is the last card as well. But Ruska, let's see. 4 mana, 5 loyalty counters. Whenever a creature you control with Death Touch deals damage to a player or a planeswalker, put a one, plus one plus one counter on that creature. So she actually makes it so that um, death touch creatures might be useful in some sort of sense. Usually they're only good blockers, but with the Ruska, if they get some hits off on the enemy's face, they might become uh, uh, very dangerous as well. And her minus, minus two is actually kind of cool. Create a 1-1 one, one black assassin creature token with death touch and whenever this creature deals damage to a planeswalker, destroy that planeswalker. So it has death touch for planeswalkers. That is super cool actually. I really like that. But uh, I think she is kind of interesting. She might be useful. I am definitely going to make a death touch deck with her. The question is... If you play a death baron with her, will the death touch from the death baron count still for her ability i would assume so because they do technically have death touch but uh, we'll see we'll see what happens that has been all the cards i'm going to go through uh, on the uh, uh, spoiler list if any of you are interested in uh, me talking a bit about some more of the cards just uh, comment down below and i'll make another video on this probably when they release a bit more cards if I find anything interesting. But yeah, that has been me. Remember to uh, like, subscribe and comment down below what kind of cards you would want to see from this expansion, War of the Spark. And I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.